Good morning. Yeah, thanks for being here. I know you've had a, a busy... Yeah, so what's going, how was your week? <laughs> um, uh, my week was pretty good. Uh, yeah. Hey, if you don't mind, before we start, I just wanted to say something real quick that's just on top of mind and in my heart right now. Um, you know, we're here talking a lot about the future of media. Um, a lot of folks in Israel are still reeling from this like, horrific terrorist attack by, by Hamas. Um, and I'm reminded all the time when these things happen how small the world is. Many of us in this room probably have lost friends and family or friends of fam friends and family of friends and family. Uh, and at Netflix, um, one of the victims of this terrorist attack, uh, Lior Weitzman, uh, was working on our first Netflix original series there called Bros. Uh, he worked in the sound department on Saturday morning out biking, stopped and texted his wife that there's been a shooting. Uh, and that's the last you heard from him because uh, he was a victim of that terrorist attack. It's a horrific t thing that's happened in the world. and. Um, just want to say our hearts are out to Lior and his family and anyone else who may have lost somebody in Israel on Saturday. Um, thank you for sharing that. I, I don't mean to... Lior, by the way, was a fantastic... I mean, worked on Fauda and uh, Tehran at Apple. And that made me... Th so very, even though I, that, this is your first Israeli original? That we produced, yeah. Because Fauda came out... Fauda was a co-production. Yeah. yeah, got it. Yeah. Interesting. Um, I'm just curious, what, I assume then production has shut down on that yeah. show? Yeah. 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 Thank, you. Um, Thank you for indulging that. Um, no, uh, as with yesterday with Ari, there's no seamless way to transition out of that. Yeah. I'm going yeah, to do my best. Hope that did not break rhythm. Not at all. Yeah. Um, you know, one of the, the themes of this event, one of the big things happening in the industry, obviously, is there's, we're in sort of a ceaseless moment of kind of tumult and change. A lot of people, uh, or a lot of that, comes from companies like you, uh, companies like YouTube. Uh, and we've reached this point where it's clear that sort of streaming has won, right? Like, or at least it is slowly replacing television as yeah. the dominant way that people watch. I mean, I mean ultimately, consumers, consumers decide what wins, right? And I think in, they're saying loud and clear that they like the control and the choice of streaming. But there remains a pretty healthy amount of skepticism as to streaming as a business. Now. Yeah. You guys are profitable. Some people would say, and we can debate this, that you are less profitable than the most profitable TV networks were. Pretty much every other media company that is trying to compete with you yeah. is losing money trying to do that. So give me the case for why you think streaming is already a good business and will only get better going forward. Yeah, look, I think it's a great business, and I think it is, it's in its infancy. We've been streaming for, you know, in some form for about 16 years. And our original content initiative, just we just passed our 10th anniversary of our first original show. Uh, so if you think about it in that way, and you think about the network business that's been at it for 75 plus years, and before that, they were, most of those were radio networks. So they've been at this for a very long time. Um, and I think that ultimately, these consumer-driven things cause businesses to react and uh, reshuffle. And, and I'd say consumer-driven because it's like, now we didn't just put something on there and say, now this is how you have to watch. Um, when we started doing this, um, streaming actually, I would say, s saved the, this industry. Um, because where we were heading at that time, remember, when we, we started this business of streaming. We started licensing content from the networks. And at the time that we were licensing, we could only get what was available, which was nothing. So we were licensing from the bottom of the barrel, things that had no revenue for anybody. Uh, shows that didn't get the syndication, things that weren't otherwise sold. Kind of like what... To be in some of the AVOD services yeah, did when right. they came around, we, where they started. And yeah. we gave it away with the DVD business. Uh, and it was, you got what you paid for back then. <laughs> uh, but I'd say what happened was that's created a whole new revenue stream for the networks and the studios. It created a whole new residual revenue stream for actors and performers who performed in those projects that were sitting on the shelf uh, and really kind of got the ball rolling in a way that, you know, that we, you know, obviously I think these, these things can take decades to build. But with their big, meaningful businesses, they, you know, that's, that's a good investment. And I'd say good, good business for us, it's a, you know, $32 billion of revenue and $6 billion of profit. And we've been growing the business pretty dramatically and pretty quick. we grew pretty quickly. Uh, we're not growing as fast right now as we want to, but we are still growing the business. So I'm curious on that point, because yeah. you, you guys in your remarks, I think your last earnings report talked about how you still aren't growing as quickly as you'd like to. There was a point in time where Every year, like clockwork, Netflix would basically add 25 million to 30 million customers. Yeah. That obviously, post-pandemic, has come way down. Yeah. 
what are you doing about that? And do you think you can get back to the level of growth you were at three, four years ago? Look, I think the key to it is you know, growing, the, the re growing revenue. And I think for us, it, that's a combination of you know, putting a great product on the board. Uh, when you talk about is streaming a good business, it is if you do it well. And I think I would say the, uh, the team at Netflix in terms of uh, the, the programming, Bella Bajari and her team are phenomenal at, at focusing on what people love. Uh, and, and their creative team is great at, at delivering for what people love. Um, the team that delivers the UI experience. Remember, something that happens at Netflix that's almost impossible anywhere else, and I'd say because of our, our distribution footprint and our recommendations, that you have the ability, if you're telling a story from Korea, to be the biggest television show in the world. That can only happen on Netflix. Um, I, and I, it's not just taking obscurity and making it big. Imagine uh, somebody as big uh, uh, as David Beckham. Uh, who releases his documentary on Netflix and in days grows his social media following by half a million people. Um, and I think this happens over and over again, the combination of our di distribution footprint and recommendation, and which I think is what distinguishes the business. And the way you grow it is by keep doing that better and better. And the opportunity to grow it is enormous. We've, uh, we're about 10% of screen time when people are using, uh, watching on their TV and at, uh, at home, uh, about 10% in our most penetrated markets like the US. Uh, around the world, we're significantly smaller. Uh, we're about 5% of consumer spending in the businesses that we're in, uh, which is you know, pay television, advertising supported television, and games. Uh, and so as you look at that, of the air, and we're just in our infancy in those businesses, and about 5% of consumer spending. So we have a ton of room to grow revenue from here. And I'd say that we're pretty um, underpriced based on those kind of st statistics of 10% of screen time and 5% of revenue. So I, I think that there's, a pl there's plenty of room to grow as long as we you know, have a high level of satisfaction with the product. The consumers, you know, it's a one button easy cancel service. So if you're not loving the new season of The Crown when it comes out in November, you jump. So we know we, we have a constant feedback circle with our uh, feedback loop for, with our members that if we're not pleasing them, they jump. Yeah, you, you, so you said underpriced. When is the next Netflix price increase coming? Um, <laughs> no, <laughs> nothing to announce, but our, our pricing philosophy has not changed, which is we have to add more value to the consumer, and ask, then we come back and ask them to pay a little bit more for it if they, if they agree. So it, it, it's been a successful formula. Have you done, re on that point, what does your research tell you about sort of the, the upper limit of what people would pay before they start to really question the value of Netflix? I, you know, we're really, I mean, we really don't spend that much time on trying to figure out how much you'll, we'll get you to pay. Because I think it's a fluid thing. So basically, if you're delivering, uh, you have to continue to deliver. So you can't. You, it's all in the hypothetical. So what I don't want to do is come in as a period of great strength and someone say, "Oh, I'll pay anything because I'm in the middle of the new season of Stranger Things," uh, and then we have to come back. But we do it every week. So you know, a lot of these services and a lot of that are out there, they get a you know a couple of hours of engagement a month. You know, we get a couple of hours of engagement a day, um, and that to me is like there's all this mystery around what what is success in streaming. It's engagement. It is how much time do people spend on the service because that tells you how much they'll pay and how long they'll stick around. Yeah, so I'm curious, you mentioned the, the success, which has been a subject of a lot of discussion over the years with yeah. regard to with you guys and, and streaming more broadly as it feels like people have less visibility into what works and don't, aren't really sure what you guys think matters. Yeah. Um, what are the metrics for Netflix that are most important when evaluating a show you, or a movie? Yeah, you guys take us to task a lot on this transparency issue. I, I would say, look, definitely relative to peers, we're incredibly transparent. Uh, and we're completely transparent with our producers so they know exactly uh, the, the viewing data. Uh, and then we're going you know, through things like the top 10 and through things like we publish the uh, viewing hours uh, of the top shows. And we're definitely hendi heading towards a much more transparent time in the business. The streaming itself is not that exotic anymore. And every other segment of the business does have, you know, Nielsen ratings or box office reports or the New York Times bestseller list, all those things. So we're heading towards that for sure. We are to a moment, to a time we'll be fully transparent on viewing data. Does that mean it's, um, sorry, go ahead. No, no, it's safe. So that will demystify this for a lot of people, which is basically what I can care about the most is relative to what it costs to put on the air, are people watching? And when they push play, do they stay? So if they push play and they drop out in the second or third ep season, right. or third which is completion show, rate for yeah, yeah. So those things all matter, but they all add up to the same thing, which is engagement. So I think you can all the data is really there. You might have to triangulate it a little bit to get to it, but all the data is really there. 
What was the, the toughest cancellation decision you've had recently? They're, they're all tough. You know, the reason why, because I think that people have got uh, a real fandom. They really love these. Some people really love all these shows, even if, the re even if the rest of the world doesn't agree with them. So for them, that's why you see sometimes these very obscure shows, and you hear very loud campaigns about stop the cancellations, because they have such an intense relationship with it. That's why I love this business so much. I, a, I relate to it. A lot of sometimes my personal taste is really far outside of the outside of the norm and i just what i've been decent at over the years and 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 pick people who are good at doing this uh but when i look at it i think it's that you know some of it was programming to my taste we'd be very small uh so but if i'm so we're trying to program to the to the world's taste um but they're all hard they really are all difficult decisions to make because people love these shows so much and 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 you know there's so some some things are just a puzzle you scratch your head but relative to what it costs to put on the air you know, did we pick a good show? Did we execute on it well? And did we pay the right price to make it? Right. So I'm wondering, you know, you talked about the world's taste, and that has, I think, a, as Netflix has expanded, your approach to programming has evolved as well. Um, you also mentioned that you started programming, it's been about 10 years. Would you say since, and when you started, that was when a lot of people talked about sort of the golden age of TV, right? This was coming out of Mad Men and Breaking Bad yeah. and some other shows. Um, then we got ushered into the era of peak TV, where there was just more and more being made. Do you think that the film and TV being made now is better or worse than it was when you started? I, I think it's better uh, because there's more of it at a very high quality. So basically, there's more of it, more to choose from. I think there's something really um, romantic about you know prestige TV. That's why we do a lot of it too. Um, beat beef this year. When you see the new season of The Crown, it's probably the most ambitious you know works you've ever seen on television, and maybe in the history of television. So I do think that there's part of that that's really important. What I'd love to do is take those shows that are incredibly well executed, critically acclaimed, award-winning, and popular. Uh, and I think things like beef. I'm really excited about beef this year because. It, this is, one of the critics wrote it that it's the most popular piece of art of the decade. And that's a really great place to be. <laughs> uh, so it's something that people really love and admire. And I think about critics and awards as a constituency, a group of influencers, and what they like is important. But so is what the audience likes. And that's, the mo and that's what really drives us. Right. Yeah. Um, but I do think like there's, every once in a while you think, oh, what's going on with TV? And then something fantastic lands every time. And I think the more, at, the more times, the more shots on goal, uh, you get at it, the more likely you're going to get something that really breaks through. And sometimes it's completely unintuitive. Squid Game did nothing to be a global show. It's made for Korea. It's pure Korean cinema uh, in, in, in the form of a TV series. And it is the most watched show on Netflix his in Netflix history and likely the history of television in the time period that it was on. Right. You guys have that. I mean, you still program more than anyone else, basically, to your point. You yeah. put out multiple new pieces of content every week, others yeah. do not. But you have leveled that off. I think we, sh we showed the chart earlier where you sort of hit like 17, 18 billion and said, okay, that's a good amount. Does the... It's, does a, good amount for, it's a good amount for now. Like I said, I think as we continue to accelerate revenue and, and subscriber growth, we'll continue to add to that too. Got it. Yeah. Um, as you see some of your peers pull back a little bit, especially overseas, yeah. do you think that's a mistake? Look, um, it's hard for people to remember that we're a, we're a big global company. So, you know, two thirds of our subscribers are outside of the U.S. Uh, and I think it's but one thing we first started doing this. I thought it was kind of a an unusual figure that about 80 percent of television viewing around the world was U.S. content, and we're five percent of the population. And I figured it probably isn't a taste thing. It's probably a distribution thing. Uh, people didn't have access to, or certain markets may not have had the scale to produce. Uh, the way that Japan did or Korea did, which had very big local audiences and, and very big local taste. So they, weren't, they didn't care that much for international, including U.S. content, uh, but mostly because they didn't have access to it. The same way we didn't have access to Korean shows before you know, felt, people fell in love with Squid Game or Spanish television before they fell in love with La Casa de Papel or French TV like Lupin. So, and I just think that that keeps happening over and over again because you can produce, as long as you really focus on the local audience, you can produce at a slightly larger scale because if you really kill it, you can get out there globally. Uh, and that the ability that we could, we brought that to the table. Uh, and I do so. I do think for me when I look at that, it's like I would. I'm glad we're not pulling back. In fact, we're growing our production uh, outside of the U.S. and in multiple languages. We're producing almost every language now. And so I, I feel like there's still a lot of room to grow there. So 
when I watch them pull out of it, I think it's because the streaming, while it is a very good business, it's a hard one, and it's one you have to do well, and you have to do it at scale. And it's really hard on, on legacy businesses trying to navigate that. Yeah. Um, one of the one of the or the poll question that I mentioned I was going to ask uh, yeah. that I'm I'm happy to throw <laughs> up there um, is what do you think is going to be this one is about in the last year your favorite series has come from one place which I'd I'd love to hear your answer on but I'm also curious you know South Korea has had kind of such a moment culturally over the last few years do you have a country that you think is the next South Korea I, I think people always, uh, a lot of people ask that because they think there was some path that we were on to make South Korea into this thing. No, I'm not, it wasn't you, no, 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 it was no. the country that really put yeah, a lot no. of resources behind it. What I think is fascinating, I think in uh, Mexico, I see it on the screen, so it's a little bit of a cheat, but um, the, the production ecosystem and the storytelling culture is, in, is phenomenal. And I think most American audiences think of Mexican TV and, uh, uh, as novellas, and I think most people think of Mexican movies, like, well, you know, Westerns and Cantin Falas, and, uh, and in fact, it's a, some, some of the most incredible storytellers and filmmakers in the world uh, are in Mexico right now, and, and the ecosystem for it is getting bigger and bigger. So I, I'd keep an eye on Mexico. Okay. Um, we've made it far enough, I have to ask about Strike. Yeah. Um, yeah. Studios issued a statement last night saying that the gap between the AMPTP and the, and the actors is too great, and that talks are no longer productive. Yeah. Um, a lot of people thought that this would end quickly once you guys got the writer's deal Me done. Me too. <laughs> yeah. So why isn't it? Um, look, I'm going to let the statement speak for itself, if you don't mind. There's a lot of detail in the statement around the offers and the, the current state of it. I, I will say that um, I know Donna Langley was here yesterday. Uh, uh, Donna and I and Bob Iger and David Zasloff have been at the table with, 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 the, uh, with SAG. Um, we've been, we had very productive talks going. Um, they kind of, what, what happened you know, last night uh, is that you know, they introduced this uh, basically a levy on subscribers on top of these, this deal, which you know, in each of the areas of the deal, which is all in this statement, you see um, historic highs in terms of the increases across the board. Uh, and we had offered a uh, success-based bonus, meaning that we completely wrap our arms around the idea that... Similar to what you offered the writers, or...? Yeah, very similar. Uh, in, fa uh, in fact, it will cost four to five times more to implement it with SAG because of the, particip the residual Number of participants. Number people, yeah, yeah. Uh, and that was rejected, and the counter was this levy on every subscriber. Uh, and prior to that was a levy on all revenue. Um, which Where basically the, the union will take a certain amount of money for every subscriber to a service? Correct. Okay. Or, or, and originally it was to every penny of revenue. Right. Uh, and we said, look, we agree that we could you know, entertain a, a success-based bonus, which led to this transparency um, issue that we, we were able to get to where, where we would share the viewing data with the guild. Um, and like I said, that, that issue that we, that resolve with the writers, uh, was not only accepted in the deal, but uh, ratified by a 99% vote of the Writers Guild. So I know that all these guilds are not created equal, and they all have different needs and more bespoke needs. But like I said, that is a one that worked, that, that rewarded success, which we agreed with. Um, but uh, a, a, a levy on top of our revenue or per subscriber with no uh, uh, insight into the revenue per subscriber or anything, it just felt... Uh, like a very like a bridge too far to add uh, this deep into the negotiation. Right now, I'm curious. Uh, there were a couple of people yesterday who were telling. And I should say, by the way, uh, this has been a very difficult time, obviously, going doing this, and and the goal here is to get people back to work. The goal is to get the town opened up. This is not just hurting the, our industry; it's hurting every other business that supports our industry, uh, and not just in, not in Cal not just in California, but you know, it's been very extremely painful in California. Uh, we're really, so we, we're, we are desperately trying to get folks back to work, and we've been at the table to do this. I, we pulled the group of CEOs together to sit at that table. All the CEOs of the MPTP have been involved in this every day. Uh, the, the four of us have been at the table, but everyone has been deeply engaged in this every day, uh, treating it as with the same urgency that we did trying to get production open during COVID. Uh, we understand there has to, a deal has got to get made, and the one thing about it, why these deals can take a long time sometimes, is this is the one deal we will make. This is the deal that SAG knows they're going to make with us, and this is the deal we know we're going to make with them. It's just a matter of how we get there. And we, as long as we can have steady, pro progressive talks, it makes sense. But uh, what happened last night was not steady or progressive. Yeah. When you resolve this, what do you think is going to be the, the impact on the business? Um, well, you, you got to remember, the pri prices escalate. Uh, the cost of content escalates you know, on a per 
on a per performer or per title basis all the time. So this is going to work into the economics of that. And some of that is, all, is forecast to happen every time you have a new contract. So um, I, I don't know what will happen because I think it will happen company by company. Um, it's, we are not changing our you know, spend forecast or any of those things. So we're, we think that it will you know, change incrementally the cost of content over time for sure. Right. That is potentially where the price increase comes in. Yeah, I mean, it wouldn't be just because of that, because obviously we've had, you know, in non-contract years, we've had price increases too. Yeah. So remember, on, the reason why this is particularly troubling on the ask, on the, on the levy, is that on top of all of the deal and all the improvements in the deal, this is also still a very competitive business. So you're paying top of market clearing price for all the talent involved in every show above and below the line. Um, so that's all still intact. So I, I just think, like I said, it's a it's a part of the economics of of, of the town uh, is that you you know, and, and I think it's really important to pay people what they're worth. And I think the performance bonus really adds an enhancement to that uh, because uh, the, sometimes that success does drive a business. Right. Um, I'm curious. One of the things that, or over the last 12 to 18 months, you guys did two things that you had long said you would not do, which was <laughs> appear at Bloomberg. <laughs> <laughs> What's the second one? Um, I'm going to go with, with advertising and crackdown and password sharing. We'll do the, we'll do the, we'll do the easy one first. Yes. Password sharing. Um, anytime previously you guys have talked about this, there's been online uproar. When you initially started raising yeah. prices, you lost a bunch of customers. You seem to have instituted this with minimal disruption. It's worked very well. How the heck did that happen? <laughs> I, I think, I hope it's a testimony to how much people love the product. That they the, so I think with the um, the, uh, the, path, the on the paid sharing, basically what we ran into was in the U.S. we became nearly ubiquitous uh, of, with users, and about a third of them were not paying; they were basically borrowing someone else's account. And uh, so we went back to them and said, "Hey, uh, we think you are seeing a lot of value for this. You want to have your own account?" And we gave them some some options. Uh, advertising was a part of that, which gave them a lower price point option. Uh, but also, um, but also give them just different options to spin off an account uh, for a relative uh, or to get your own account. And a lot of folks have chose chose one or one or the other. Uh, and it's just, and we continue to grow in the market where we otherwise were pretty open, pretty much fully penetrated. So it gave us a much bigger addressable market in the U.S. and around the world uh, to go after. So is that likely again, more of a short-term bump, or do you think it benefits? Well, it's a it's a short term bump, but it's a long term bump, and those those economics apply to the long term membership. So, right. so that's that's why. But I think in that way, it was a, a helpful thing for us. And like I said, I think it really was, uh, I think a testimony to the relationship uh, the consumers have with Netflix and the programming on Netflix that uh, they didn't when they they'd answer that poll pretty much the same as you did. Yes. So. Although I'm I'm curious, and I, I do want to get to advertising, but a common criticism of of Netflix that you hear in the industry. In LA, New York, they people feel like the programming on it has gotten worse. I think it's just there's more of it, and it's not all for you. So that's that's the truth. So I think I, when I look at that and say, you know, in ten years we've been doing this, um, you know, 188 Emmy awards, uh, almost a thousand nominations, uh, uh, 122, I believe. Uh, Oscar nominations and 22 wins, and including eight Best Picture nominees, uh, two last year. Um, and I look at that and I think, like, what people, I think what people do see is that we've expanded the offering. You know, so yes, we have Beef and Diplomat and Crown and all these programs, but we also have great, like, action shows like Night, uh, Night Agent, uh, which you see this emergence of, of Gabe, Gabe Basso as a, break, a brand new action star, uh, or a kind of a relentless action movie like Extraction and Extraction 2, or uh, mother for you know Jennifer for J Lo, uh, and this you know they would say that when we first started we only did a handful of shows, so people think oh they always made these real prestige shows like AMC and that's all they did, and I said yeah that wasn't true then either. Uh, we also had a show called Hemlock Grove that people forgot about pretty quick, uh, and those were in the earliest days of what we were doing. Um, so I feel feel like we always were trying to get to the variety and breadth, and today we have incredible variety and breadth. That if you love Love Is Blind. You would not say that Netflix programming got worse because you love Love is Blind. Uh, and it's a good show. If you love these reality dating shows, it's as good as it gets. And we weren't even doing reality programming three or four years ago. Yeah. So I, I feel like a lot of people like pick their personal taste and say, if, when, if I see other things that I'm not watching, I think that some, you know, the, the service has changed. It hasn't changed. It's grown. Right. Yeah. Um, one of the other criticisms you get is that 
when the show, and you, I know you, 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 you've already talked about why this is, you think it's BS with social and all that, but is that when shows come out, they don't land. And one of the things, or they don't create the same cultural impact. And one of the things that you guys have been doing, I think, to push against this a little bit, is you've started to create you know, toys and live experiences. You've got yeah. the Bridgerton ball, and yeah. you've got the Stranger Things ha uh, store, and all these different things. Um, what is, is next for you in this area of building sort of moments and marketing campaigns around your projects? Yeah, um, so yeah, we have a consumer products group. Um, like other consumer products groups, it's really not, uh, not, we don't focus that much on kind of revenue and profit uh, on that business. It's a lot about building fandom. Uh, so it's a combination where kind of uh, consumer product sales and marketing and publicity all kind of come together and help facilitate incredible fandom. So uh, we do these, the, these experiences that are wildly, wildly popular. Um, the one that people first probably took notice of was the Stranger Things drive-through that we did during COVID. That, uh, and these were pretty decently priced uh, tickets that people really show up for uh, and really have an incredibly immersive experience with their favorite show. So in the, it was in drive-through form with, with Stranger Things. We have several other Stranger Things experiences that, still, that are travel the world now. Um, we have uh, this uh, Bridgerton ball. Um, which is uh, a people show up in costume uh, and go to the Bridgerton Ball. And people love it so much, they propose marriage in there. There's a dozens of people that have, been that have proposed marriage in these events. Uh, and it's incredibly elaborate. But people show up and like, where did, where did you have that costume? I just had it laying around the house to go to the Bridgerton Ball. Uh, and this, oh, we can go back one if you don't mind. Yeah, we, we, pre we preempted. Oh, I, I went in the wrong way. OK, so this is where the next generation of this said, all these traveling experiences that we've been doing, uh, we're going to pull them together and, and start to build out these more permanent experiences. Um, this is a concept of one, something we're calling Netflix House, uh, that will be full of these kind of permanent and traveling experiences and consumer experiences. There'll be food experiences uh, like we, that are basically taking what we've learned from all of these and putting them under, uh, under one roof in several major cities around the world. And they'll be permanent. Oh, here, here's the Bridgerton Ball. All those people in costumes, that's their own costumes. Uh, that's the, the, the escape room for the Casa di Papel, where people came, they got in costume, they did their thing. Uh, this is for a one, for one Piece event. This is Netflix Bites, which is a restaurant experience we did here in LA. Uh, that it was sold out the entire run of the, of the, show, of the restaurant. And there's the, the new Netflix Stranger Things experience. And this is a, the Tudum Fest, where this all came together as a big live event uh, we did in Brazil a few months ago, where 25,000 people came out to, to meet all the stars of the, the new Netflix shows. So this is what that looked like. What's the timetable on when the first Netflix house is going to open? Uh, we're in the works of it now, so not, no timing to announce yet, but we're trying to get it open next year. Yeah. Do you have a preference where the first one opens? No, I and mean, we were just looking at major cities around the world, or some smaller markets too, where this could be, um, where you can really build up the fandom, but where it's a little more novel. Uh, to get an experience like this in your town. Yeah. Yeah. And we think it's one of these, it's not like, don't, don't think of it like Disneyland. Think of it as closer to City Walk, something you might go to several times a month, uh, not just once every couple of years. Are you going to have a movie theater? Some will. Some will. Really? Yeah. Showing yeah. Netflix movies? Yeah. This is my chance to ask your favorite question. <laughs> um, We're lucky. We live in LA, right? You can go to, pretty soon you'll be able to go to the historic Egyptian theater which, that we've just beautifully restored. So um, to reopen. But I have to ask, because Apple's about to put a Martin Scorsese movie on screens for 45 yep. days before it's streaming. You did Scorsese's last movie. You negotiated possibly putting it on movie screens, and it, it didn't work out. Yeah. Do you think as you see Apple and Amazon move in on theaters a little more, will that competition change your strategy at all? Because if you want to work with certain filmmakers, they're going to demand it? Look, I, I, I do. I mean, I try not to be cynical about the question. <laughs> Because if, yes, if people keep asking me, why don't you do things like everyone else does? And then I look at the financial results, and I say, maybe this is not what, other, what people want, in a way. Because then I've, I've not been able to see, honestly, a direct correlation between the theatrical run and the demand in the second window. What I have seen is that that theatrical run sometimes takes the most passionate fan out of the market. And uh, the films don't tend to be any bigger because they were big in the box office or because they were in the box office already. You create, it's just a, a different window of, of demand generation. And we, we meet that demand that we generate on Netflix. And that's our core business. So we do put movies in theaters. I mean, Irishman was on 900 screens uh, 
and I think uh, I think uh, Flower Moon's on like three thousand. Right. Um, so when they look at it, look at it and say, look, I, and it, it, ten Oscar nominations for The Irishman, very successful on Netflix. It's one of our top movies of all time. Uh, so when I look at that and think there was, and I don't see any discernible difference. We have a lot of pay one movies, you know, that come on in that second window after the theater, uh, and they don't necessarily perform bigger than our biggest original sh films do. So when I look at that and think that uh, the theory that you have to put movies in the theaters to get, you know, uh, for some long stretch of time before you give it to your subscribers who paid to make the movie, right, with their subscription fee, I don't think the real payoff is in the favor of the consumer. Right. So that's why we really, again, consumer driven. Uh, if you want to see this movie and you love it and you don't live in a major city, you have access to see it on opening day. That's really novel. And it, and it opens up that distribution footprint, you know, around the globe. Okay, we'll talk about one thing that. Uh... And, and I would say, though, I was joking, but, you know, we, I understand the, the romance, the romantic connection people have with the movie theater. Um, and we kind of and not only acknowledge it, but we support it. In, in the Paris Theater in New York that we saved was the last single screen theater in Manhattan. The theater's around 75 years old. We just put in a brand new, incredible uh, Atmos sound system. Uh, so we, we, we use it to premiere our films, to screen our films. But we also do use it as a revival house uh, that's just been showing sold out, you know, to sold out audiences, uh, all these kind of great movies that have never been seen in Atmos before. I will say to your point about the demand for movies that sh show in theaters first, it does feel like a lot of the most streamed movies are those that are in uh, in theaters first, but I'm, I'm not going to debate this with you right now. Not on Netflix, right? We're on the biggest platform, not on Netflix. Not, you're talking about on other services that don't have meaningful day and date movies. Right. Yeah. Um, one thing that you do do uh, that also everyone else does is advertising, which I meant to ask you about earlier. Yes. Um, your head of advertising just left after like a year at the company, yeah. very new in this. That's usually not a great sign. Um, there seems to be mixed. <laughs> <laughs> see, look, the, uh, Wall Street was very positive on your advertising business when you gave an upfront and you had some numbers and they thought that was yeah. good. Um, there's also been some reporting that suggests that you're way below what you had wanted. So where, where are you with advertising? Look, they should be excited about it. Um, we are. Uh, we're a year into it. Uh, Jeremy, by the way, did a great job getting us to where we're at today. Uh, what, what we have to do, by the way, not just us, all, all, of these, all the platforms that have added uh, an ad option, um, they've all got to do the same thing, which is they have to kind of get that, that tier at scale and, the, and to grow that scale with, with, with fans and viewers. Um, so the building the ad team and building the infrastructure and all those things which Jeremy did, which is great for us doing that, we definitely appreciate it. We're super excited about Amy Reinhardt coming in. She's a veteran at Netflix who understands all the complexities of you know, growing new businesses at Netflix. So um, it's a, you should look at it as a, a doubling down, not a, not a uh, failing and moving on. Uh, and it's new. It's, we're definitely in our infancy, and it's definitely not at the scale that we want it to be at yet. Um, and consumers have to choose between it. And I'd say, when you said we would never do advertising, what, when we first started the business, we were classically counter-positioned against advertising. So for us to say we would never do it, it was part of that thing to say, if you go back to our old DVD business, our counter-position was no late fees. Audiences hated, you know, fans hated paying late fees. So that was our big thing, no movie watching with no late fees. And when we started getting into streaming, we saw this is streaming will be the new television. And what do, what do people not like about TV? Waiting and ads. So we're sitting through the ads or waiting until next week. So our classic counter position was watch it all at once and no ads. Now, what, what, what happened is as we got bigger and bigger and more deeply penetrated into the world and also just smarter about it, we said, hey, we're not, we don't have an option for people who don't care about advertising and, will, and want a lower price. And I'd say it's a generational thing for sure. Uh, you saw YouTube and, and us on that chart. A lot of those folks have been watching a lot of stuff on YouTube with ads for a long time. And people like my son, you know, who basically now that he pays his own bills, he's like, yeah, I'll take half price with him watch ads. I watch ads on YouTube all the time. So it, it's for him, so it's, we, were, we were touting that we were all about choice and then not giving a choice to those folks who wanted a lower price and didn't mind advertising. Now, now we have to do the other thing. We have to be able to be, we have to deliver for advertisers and we have to deliver for the audience a product that's innovative and doesn't you know, you know, interrupt their viewing experience in a way that uh, makes the viewing experience worse. All those things we have to work on and get better and better at. And we're a year into it. Like that in games, we're, these are also areas of the business that we're looking to deepen the value for consumers and drive revenue. And you know, we have to do both of those things. We have to drive value first and then you can drive revenue. 
Uh, if we had more time, I'd ask you about games, uh, but we got to get to the CEO of YouTube. Thank you so much okay, for being here. Okay, awesome. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.